Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you to today's webinar of Wire Technology. My name is Melanie Börder and I am working in Wyatt's marketing department and I will guide you through the program this morning. Um, first, I would like to inform you about some technical matters. Please note um, that it is important to mute your microphone in case you are logged in through your phone, but don't forget to turn on your speaker so that you can hear us. If there will come up questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to transfer them to us via our chat. Just type your question and press send. We will then either give you an answer back via the chat or talk about it in the discussion after the webinar. If you get logged out during the webinar for any reason, please repeat the login process the way you did it before again. To figure out what our audience works with, two questions will appear now and it would be nice if you could answer them. This way we are able to focus on our content of, webina of webinars on our customers' need by finding, out, by finding out the topics of interest. So you see the first question. And you have no time to choose your answer. Okay. So as you can see, 83 of all of you um, measure the polymers by multi-angle light scattering and 17 do this via conventional ways of calibration. The second question. Do you have problems with the separation of your polymers? So it's quite a simple question. Okay. Eighty percent do have problems uh, with the separation and 20 don't have any problems with the separation of polymers. Maybe we can find a solution for your problems. So we will now continue. Um, as you already know, um, our webinar is titled Characterization Molar Structure in um, synthetic and natural polymers by multi-angle light scattering. The presentation is done by Professor Dr. Stepan Potsimek from the University of Padubice. He works as a head of the Department of Analytical and Physical Chemistry at the Czech R&D company Synpo and as a professor at the Institute of Chemistry and Technology of Polymer Materials of the University of Padubice. He's also a scientific consultant for Wire Technology Europe. His research interests include polymer characterization using light scattering, size exclusion chromatography, asymmetric flow feed flow fractionation, and dilute solution viscometry. In particular, he focused on the method development, study of structure property relationships, and characterization of polymer branching. Also, he's the author and co-author of over 50 scientific papers and books. And with this little introduction, I hand over to you, Stepan. Okay, thank you for a nice introduction. Good morning to everyone, and uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, this webinar. This talk is uh, about uh, multi-angle light scattering and the abbreviation is uh, MAUS and uh, the most frequent uh, application of MAUS is, uh, is a combination with gel permeation chromatography 
which is also called size exclusion chromatography, so we can use any term you prefer. The most um, usual application of SEC mouse is for the determination of molar mass distribution, but uh, using mouse we can get much more information about the polymers, especially if we use uh, another advanced detector, which is in this case online viscometer, and then we can get information about the polymer structure and branching. And uh, in case of uh, failure of uh, SEC separation, and I could hear that uh, many of you have problems with the separation, we can use uh, another separation technique, which is called asymmetric flow, field flow fractionation. And I will also briefly introduce this technique. Light scattering is a natural phenomenon that uh, explains uh, blue color of sky or red sunrise and sunset. But except for the natural phenomenon, it's also an analytical technique which is used to characterize polymer molecules by measurement of the intensity of scattered light. And uh, the traditional approach uh, is uh, measurement of non-fractionated sample in batch mode. The sample is prepared at several concentrations and uh, typically measured at scintillation wires. And uh, it is measured at uh, multiple angles. And uh, the angle variation is measured step by step uh, by rotating photodiode. And such instruments are called goniometers. And they are still in production but uh, they are not convenient for routine technique and for routine polymer characterization. So the instruments uh, that uh, can measure the intensity of uh, light at multiple angles simultaneously are called multi-angle light scattering. And uh, these instruments are typically equipped uh, with the flow cell, which uh, allows the sample to go in and out, and that means it can be used as detector for chromatography. And the scheme of uh, the flow cell is shown here. So the sample goes through the flow cell through narrow uh, channel uh, in the same direction as uh, incident laser beam. And uh, the light scattered at different angles is uh, measured by array of photodiodes. And uh, the real uh, flow cell arrangement is shown here. The flow cell, the most important part, is uh, a small piece of glass of perfect optical quality. It's narrow uh, channel inside, and uh, the glass is mounted into stainless steel holder, which allows the sample to go in and go out to another detector. And uh, the real picture of the flow cell is shown here, and the cell is then uh, hidden in this part, which is called reed head. And this is uh, laser, laser, and the light beam comes uh, from this side, and the scattered light is measured by photodiodes, uh, which are this yellow part here. And uh, light scattering uh, is. Uh, typically called like absolute method of molar mass uh, determination. And this is true because there is a theoretically derived, physically sound relation between the intensity of scattered light that we can measure and the molar mass, which is the quantity we want to measure. Uh, the intensity of scattered light is expressed as uh, Rayleigh ratio. Rayleigh ratio is uh, the intensity of scattered light uh, related to the, to the incident intensity and geometry of uh, the detector. Concentration is uh, either known in batch measurement or it is uh, measured by uh, concentration sensitive detector, which is mostly refractive index detector. Then uh, we have uh, K star, which is just a constant that includes several uh, constants like refractive index of the solvent, wavelength, 
Avogadro's loss number and uh, the quantity which is called specific refractive index increment, DNDC, which is characteristic for given polymer and uh, given solvent. M is molar mass, that is the quantity we want to get. P theta is particle scattering function that I will explain on the next slide. And A2 is uh, the second virial coefficient which characterizes uh, interactions between polymer molecules and the solvent. The equation has uh, several alternatives that have different names. So this one is Rayleigh, uh, this one is uh, Debye equation, this one is Zim equation and Berry equation. And all these formalisms basically describe the same. The relation between molar mass concentration and the intensity of scattered light at particular angle. Particle scattering function describes how the intensity of scattered light changes its angle of observation. And what we can see on this picture is that for small molecules, the intensity of scattered light does not change with the angle. Uh, for larger molecules, the intensity of scattered light decreases with increase in angle. And uh, the decrease is more pronounced for larger particles, larger molecules. And the important thing is that, uh, uh, that uh, from the slope of uh, the particle scattering function at zero angle, you can calculate another important quantity, which is called root mean square radius, and more frequently perhaps uh, called radius of gyration. And radius of gyration describes uh, the distribution of mass around the center of gravity. That means that is the parameter that describes the size of polymer molecules in solution. And that's another important quantity that we can use to, to gain more information about our polymers. So let me start with combination of SEC and mouse detector. And let me start to remind you how we get molar mass by conventional SEC. So that is the approach that can lead to false information. So conventional calibration is uh, used uh, by uh, uh, the conventional calibration starts uh, with the measurement uh, of uh, narrow standards of narrow molar mass distribution and known molar mass. And then uh, the molar masses are related with illusion volume. And uh, the relation that we get is called uh, calibration curve. And using this calibration curve, uh, we can process uh, the chromatogram of unknown polydispersed polymer. And the curve for any elution volume gives molar mass. So for any elution volume, we can read molar mass from the curve. And then the signal intensity at any elution volume gives weight fraction of molecules that elute at certain elution volume. And then we have molar mass. That means we have molar masses mi and weight fractions wi of molecules that elute at different elution volumes. And that is everything we need to calculate molar mass averages, like number average molar mass, weight average molar mass. Then we can get cumulative distribution curve. And by, from this curve, we can get differential distribution curve. So, this is approach that looks very simple, and actually it is simple, and it works fine. But the problem is that different polymers have different distribution, have different calibration curves, like shown in this picture. So this picture shows calibration curves of different polymers, and these curves were obtained by light scattering detection. And we can immediately see that uh, if we use polystyrene calibration for phenoxy resin, for example, we overestimate molar mass. We use, if we use the same calibration curve for, let's say, polybenzyl mesacrylate, then we underestimate the molar mass. And moreover, even if we use this curve for branch polystyrene, that means it is the same chemistry but different structure, we, again, we underestimate molar mass of, of branch polystyrene. It means that uh, the errors are typically several tens percent, but it can go to extreme numbers like uh, shown in this uh, case of branch polybenzyl mesacrylate, that is this magenta curve. So if we process 
this highly branched polymer by calibration curve for linear polystyrene, we get completely misleading results. And actually, despite different methods that uh, deal with the calibration in SEC, the only efficient solution is actually to forget about calibration and to use light scattering detector and the most efficient detector is multi-angle light scattering detector. So the scheme is shown here, so nothing particularly strange in the SEC setup. So it's a regular SEC setup consisting of pump, injector, typically it's auto sampler, columns, then we have uh, mostly refractive index detector that would be Optilab TRX in this case. You can have UV detector for samples that absorb UV light. And then we add additional detector which is multi-angle light scattering detector. And in this case we have either Dawn, Helios or Mini Dawn. And then we can get absolute molar mass for molecules that elute from the SEC columns. So example of the measurement is shown here. So we have the signal from light scattering detector, the signal from refractive index detector, and of course because we measure at multiple angles, we already know this scheme. So each photodiode actually gives one chromatogram. So we have multiple chromatograms, and then the intensities of light scattered at different angles are extrapolated to zero angle, and using one of the light scattering formalisms, we can get information about molar mass using actually if at low concentrations, typical of SEC separation, we can neglect the term with the second variable coefficient without any substantial error. And then the molar mass is calculated from the intensity at zero angle and additional parameter root mean square radius is calculated from the slope of uh, this relation. So uh, this is example for single elution volume and, and this calculation is performed at regular time intervals, typically it is every second, every two seconds or half second. And we get the information that can be used to get molar mass distribution, and that is probably the most important property of polymer materials because it is related to many important properties that are important for the applications of the polymer. So some properties affected by molar mass distribution are listed here. And the example of the measurement is shown on this picture. So again, we can see signals from two detectors, one angle from light scattering detector and the signal from refractive index detector. Once again, the refractive index detector is used to get information about the concentration which is needed to calculate the molar mass. And uh, the black curve consists of several hundreds of data points. As I said, we measure molar mass at regular time intervals. So this curve is related, this curve consists of several hundreds of data points, molar masses at particular elution volume slides, and the same is performed for root mean square radius and uh, what we can he we can see that at uh, lower radii below about 10 nanometers the the data points uh, become scattered and that is because there is no angular variation of scattered light intensity for small molecules and the radius is measured from the slope of angular variation so because there's no angular variation we cannot measure radius for small molecules, uh, its radius uh, below about 10 nanometers. And finally, we can get the information about distribution, which is expressed either as cumulative distribution plot or differential distribution plot. And uh, I know that people 
mostly prefer distribution uh, plot expressed as differential distribution. But it's not that easy to read. I think that it's easier to read the cumulative uh, distribution. But we, of course, we get both distribution curves uh, from the data. And we can calculate all molar mass averages that are used in polymer science to characterize polymer molecules. And uh, what is also very important to emphasize that uh, we get molar mass uh, information uh, which is absolute. That means uh, it's not related to any standards. So it is uh, the molar mass uh, in, in true numbers. And uh, moreover, the obtained results are excellently reproducible. So uh, the example is shown here. So that is the measurement of one broad polystyrene that was a uh, long time available. It was NIST 706 polystyrene standard. And this table shows the measurement of this standard. Uh, so four measurements in 2008. And then the same sample was measured four times again in 2011 and four times in 2012 and two times recently uh, in this year. And if you look at relative standard deviation for the weight average, it's uh, below 2%. So that is excellent reproducibility of the measurement. And this reproducibility is never obtained by conventional size exclusion chromatography. Number average and the average, uh, the standard deviation is a little bit higher, but still very good. And at this point, I'd like to emphasize that weight average molar mass is obtained by first principle of light scattering. That means that actually we don't need efficient separation. So we can get weight average molar mass even without any separation in batch mode. Number average and the average molar masses are calculated under the assumption that what goes from the columns is monodispersed. And even with high performance columns, this assumption is never completely fulfilled. And that means that uh, these averages are affected by the performance of SCC separation. And of course, using different columns, uh, the columns of different history, different age, they may differ in their separation performance. And that this is reflected uh, by uh, higher standard deviation of uh, number average and the average. But it's also worth mentioning that the results were generated using three different mouse detectors and, three, and two different RI detectors in different combinations. That means that actually the results are independent of the detector that is used for the measurement. Mouse and online viscometry is an additional step forward to get an excellent tool for the investigation of polymer structure in detail. So this picture shows how online viscometer works. Recently, we had a viscometer webinar, which is available on Wired web page. So uh, at, at, at this point, I only briefly uh, remind uh, that uh, the online viscometer measures uh, specific viscosity. And the specific viscosity is uh, measured uh, from the pressure difference between two lines of uh, bridge. So this is a bridge design viscometer. And by, using, by measurement of the pressure difference, we get specific viscosity. And specific viscosity divided by concentration at very low concentration is intrinsic viscosity. And uh, because the concentration at uh, size exclusion chromatography, I mean the concentration of molecules that elute from the columns, the concentrations are very low. So we can consider that the concentration is 0. That means that dividing specific viscosity by concentration, we get intrinsic viscosity directly. That means that similarly, as in the case of, uh, of uh, molar mass, 
we get intrinsic viscosity across the peak. That means that in addition to molar mass and root mean square radius, we have uh, intrinsic viscosity. And uh, applications of intrinsic viscosity or the meaning of intrinsic viscosity in polymer science is uh, that it is first of all fundamental characteristic of uh, polymers. And uh, in size exclusion chromatography, it can be used uh, for so-called universal calibrations. That means that either it is used to recalculate the polystyrene calibration to calibration valid for another polymer, or more efficiently, online viscometer is used to measure intrinsic viscosity instead of molar mass, and then the molar mass is obtained from so-called universal calibration curve. From several reasons, this approach, so theoretically valid, does not work quite well. And it was shown in the viscosity webinar I have mentioned. We can use intrinsic viscosity to calculate hydrodynamic radius, and this is important because I already explained that root mean square radius cannot be measured for small polymers. Hydrodynamic radius can be calculated from intrinsic viscosity down to about one nanometer. And we can also use intrinsic viscosity to calculate the root mean square radius. So root mean square radius by principle is measured by multi-angle light scattering, but it can be also calculated from the intrinsic viscosity using so-called Florifox uh, approach. But anyway, because we already have mouse detector uh, uh, after the SEC columns, the most efficient application of uh, intrinsic viscosity is to plot intrinsic viscosity versus molar mass in double logarithmic scale. And the plot is called Margovin plot. And uh, the slope of this plot already bears information about the structure of polymers. So the typical slopes in for linear polymers in uh, thermodynamically good solvents are around 0.7. And uh, for, on the other hand, for highly compact spheres, the slope is zero. And uh, the slope increases uh, for extended chains, like for polyelectrolytes. And it decreases its increase in degree of branching. So that means that if we have uh, plots with slower slope than 0.7, then we, we can estimate that the polymer is branched. And I will show you how we can get information about the branching from Mark Hoving plot. So polymer branching, that is another information about synthetic and natural polymers that, again, can alter the polymer properties. And it's important to mention that uh, we can change the polymer properties without uh, changing the chemical structure only by introducing branch points. So similarly, as in the case of molar mass distribution, branching affects many important polymer properties. The branch structures are different. So you can see the scheme of forearm, star, or randomly branch polymer, or comb structure. And there are, in, there are also some more exotic structures uh, in, uh, in the literature. So uh, the golden standard for the characterization of branching is so-called conformation plot. The conformation plot is a plot of root mean square radius, radius of gyration, against molar mass in double logarithmic scale. And for linear polymers, we always get linear conformation plots with a slope around 0.58. So this is example for linear polyethylene. So the slope is 0.56, close to the value we can expect for linear polymers in thermodynamically good solvents. And then we have another plot in red for commercial polyethylene, and the slope is significantly lower. And that means that this sample is branched. And that is not surprising, because many commercially available polyethylene samples are branched, because the branching 
branch units are created during the synthesis by chain transfer. So if you want to to quantify branch in the sense of number of branch units, we have to go back to 1949 and uh, two scientists, two excellent scientists, Wim and Stockmeyer, published this paper and they theoretically actually calculated uh, how we can characterize branching and they introduced the parameter which is called branching ratio. And this branching ratio G is defined as mean square radius of branch molecules divided by mean square, linear, uh, mean square radius of linear molecules at the same molar mass. And actually we have this information. So we can calculate branching ratio because we have a radius of our unknown sample that we want to characterize. And then we have the radius corresponding radius of linear standard at the same molar mass. So we can calculate branching ratio. By definition, branching ratio equals unity for linear polymers and decreases its increasing degree of branching. That means it's increasing number of branch units in polymer chain. That means that branching actually makes polymer molecules more compact, smaller. And Using the same paper, we can find equations that relate branching ratio and number of branch units or number of uh, arms in star-like polymers. And these equations were theoretically derived. Actually, they were never really confirmed by experiments because it's almost impossible, or maybe it is completely impossible to prepare randomly branch polymer with no number of uh, branch units. But, but anyway, it seems that these equations provide reasonably results, reasonable results. So uh, example of uh, the characterization of randomly branch polymer polyethylene in this case is on this uh, slide. So this is the branch ratio G as a function of molar mass. So it starts at about one. That means that the molecules with the lowest molar mass in that sample are actually linear. And branching ratio decreases with increasing molar mass, which is reasonable because uh, we can expect that for randomly branched polymers, the probability that the molecule contain branch unit increases with molar mass. And then we get the number of branch units per molecule. That means we get number of branch units as a function of uh, molar mass. And this is very detailed information about uh, the distribution of branching and about the structure of, of this polymer. So that is the calculation of branching using so-called radius method. That means that we, we get branching information from the radius. And as I already mentioned, with online viscometer, we can get Margovin plot. And that's another way to branch in. So this picture shows Margovin plot, again, for linear polyethylene. So the slope is 0.67. So that is what we expect for, for linear polymer. And then we have, again, commercially available polymer. and. Uh, the plot is shifted to lower intrinsic viscosities and moreover it is curved and, and this curvature is typical for for branch polymers. So one more example not to talk only about polyethylene. So this is example of linear and star branch polylactic glycolic acid and this is important polymer that is used as uh, uh, drug delivery uh, for production of drug delivery systems and uh, the rate of degradation depends not only on molar mass but also on the degree of branching so this is star branch polymer that means it depends on number of uh, arms and we get reasonable data even for smaller polymers that means that we could not use radius calculations or calculation from, from the conformation plot for these molecules, but we can calculate using intrinsic viscosity. Instead of 
branching ratio G, we define branching ratio G prime, which is uh, intrinsic viscosity of branch molecule divided by intrinsic viscosity of linear molecule as the same molar mass. And again, we can see that we have the data. We have intrinsic viscosity of branch and intrinsic viscosity of linear polymer at given molar mass. The relation to G is kind of complicated. Oh, it, it's very simple, but uh, that the E parameter is called uh, draining parameter. That is kind of uh, uncertain parameter. It's, uh, it's not easy to, to get it, but uh, basically we can estimate this value. Typically, it's around 0.7. And then using intrinsic viscosity, we can calculate number of arms as a function of molar mass. And uh, to, to get better feeling of the distribution of branching, uh, the curve can be completed or it can be overlaid on the cumulative distribution. And that means we can read how many number of arms correspond to certain fraction of molecules. So this is very detailed description of polymer sample. That once again, that would be this star branch polylactic glycolic acid. So that means we get not only information about molar mass distribution, we get also information about the distribution of number of arms. Size exclusion chromatography works fine, but for some samples it fails and then we can use alternative technique, which is called asymmetric flow, field flow fractionation. I think that, again, if you go to Wired website, uh, you find a webinar that was devoted to this technique. So uh, very briefly, the technique uh, has several advantages over SCC, and it is especially useful for polymers with ultra-high molar mass fractions, branch polymers, or polymers that have tendency to stick in SEC columns or some supermolecular structures or nanoparticles. So this slide shows principle. So the principle is that the separation takes place in a thin ribbon-like channel, which is created by sandwiching thin spacer of typical thickness 350 microns. The, set, the spacer is sandwiched between two blocks. One is solid and one is uh, semi-permeable. That means it's permeable for solvent, but it's not permeable for molecules. This picture shows the side view into the channel. And uh, as uh, we have uh, the flow that goes to the channel from the pump, and then we have semi permeable block, we have actually two flows in the channel. One is in longitudinal direction from the inlet to outlet to detector. And then we have cross flow. So in this picture, this is longitudinal flow and the cross flow. And the cross flow pushes the molecules towards the semi-permeable wall. And they are kept in, uh, in the channel because the wall is not permeable for the molecules. The counteracting force is diffusion. The smaller molecules can diffuse more against the cross-flow field, and the molecules create layers. And the smaller molecules create uh, uh, thicker layers that protrude more to faster moving streamlines because there is parabolic flow profile that's laminar flow in the channel. And the small molecules move faster followed by larger and larger molecules. So the separation of narrow polystyrene standards is shown here. So it's, again, separation according to hydrodynamic volume, not according to molar mass, but in SEC, as in hydro, according to hydrodynamic volume. But it's in opposite direction. It is from small molecules to large molecules. So this is example for polymethyl mesacrylates. Uh, the molar mass obtained by SCC mass plotted as a function of elution time. And then the same plot for the AF4. The curves here are the signal from refractive index detector. 
if you overlay the distribution curves and compare molar mass averages, basically the two techniques give identical results. That means that no, no difference, no obvious advantage of AF4. But there are samples where the evidence, uh, where the advantage is evident. This is example of the analysis of emulsion copolymer. Emulsion copolymers typically contain fractions with very high molar mass which are also branched and they are created by chain transfer to polymer and if you look at, uh, at the molar mass profiles they are different and uh, if we transfer these uh, data to cumulative distribution functions and molar mass averages uh, it is evident that uh, the results are different they are significantly different so uh, the plot from SCC is at the region of lower molar masses shifted to higher molar masses and that is actually because of, of this upswing and in the region of high molar masses the plot from SCC is shifted to lower molar masses and that is because of degradation of polymer molecules by shearing forces in SCC columns. That means that uh, the distribution from SCC miles is unreasonably narrow if we compare weight average and number average molar mass and actually uh, the true information about the molar mass distribution is obtained only by AR4. And this picture explains the upswing on the molar mass plot. The upswing uh, is uh, due to the presence of branch molecules and branch molecules have tendency to be anchored in the pores of column packing. That means that the, the, the branch is actually, one branch can anchor the entire molecule. And then some large molecules that should elude at the beginning of chromatogram are retained by this anchoring effect and they elude later together with smaller molecules and then we have multi-angle light scattering detector and by principle MALS measures the weight average molar mass and the Z average root mean square radius and they are sensitive to presence of small amount of fractions with very high molar mass and uh, this is another example again it is emulsion copolymer and if you look in this case we have uh, two different samples if you look on the results obtained by SCC mass, we can see actually identical distribution curves and identical weight average and Z average molar mass. If you look at the results from AF4 mass, then the sample have identical distribution in the region of lower molar masses, but there is significant difference in the region of high molar masses. And it means that uh, the blue sample actually in SCC is degraded again by shearing forces. That means that the shearing degradation actually in this case makes the samples to look identical, but in reality they differ significantly by the content of fractions with very high molar mass. And uh, one more example. So if we go to the same sample I showed uh, on the previous uh, slide, the want to get branching information so uh, the, the confirmation plot uh, obtained by SCC miles has very strange shape so we would expect something what would be linear or, or slightly curved uh, but actually this shape is uh, very unusual and if the same sample is measured by AF4 miles we get what we expect so we get the confirmation plot that is uh, from uh, at, at, at this region, at certain region, it's perfectly linear. The slope is 0.52, which is slightly less than uh, it is typical for linear random coil. So we can expect that these molecules are slightly branched. And then we have the change of the slope at, at the region of very high molar masses, somewhere around 10 million and more. And this slope is point. 0.3, about 0.3. And this 
very low slope gives evidence about highly compact structures and because the polymer was prepared by emulsion polymerization we can expect that these species are swollen entire latex particles that were completely uh, cross-linked. So uh, this information about the structure only by separation by airflow and using mouse detector. And the last method to cover is combination of mouse with APC. So APC appeared uh, several years ago. It means advanced polymer chromatography. It's a term from company Waters that uh, for the first time came it's new generation of SEC columns. So these columns use very small particles below three microns and uh, the particles are highly rigid and they have to be rigid because actually using so small particles there is extremely high pressure in the columns. But uh, I'd like to emphasize that actually the APC is SEC or GPC, so there is no principal difference. Again, it is separation according to hydrodynamic volume, but the method brings several advantages. So, first of all, it's very short analysis time and also very low consumption of solvent, but we need uh, special columns and special instrumentation. Now we have uh, available Microdon and uh, UTREX, that means mouse and RI detectors that are designed for APC. And the comparison is right here. So left hand picture shows uh, the signals from light scattering, a refractive index detector and molar mass versus illusion time plots from conventional regular SEC using 300 times 7.5 millimeter columns, two columns in series. And then we have the results from APC using three columns, 150 millimeters, small inner diameter, lower flow rate. And uh, the time needed for the separation is about the one third of the time for regular columns. By comparison of distribution curves, we can see that uh, the curves almost overlay and uh, the weight average, number average uh, and Z average molar masses are shown here. Excellent agreement between weight average and Z average molar masses and it's also worth mentioning that the measurement was performed not only using different columns also using different mouse and RI detectors, that means again we can see excellent reproducibility of the measurement. In case of number average we get slightly higher value from APC probably due to not that efficient separation in the region of uh, lower molar masses. So we come to conclusions. So uh, I think that uh, we can uh, claim that um, mouse detector can provide absolute molar mass distribution by measurement of the intensity of scattered light. Uh, we don't need any standards and uh, moreover once again not only absolute molar masses but also excellent reproducibility we get more information about the polymers, not only molar mass distribution, but also structure information, mainly branching. And uh, especially we can go deep into the molecular structure of polymers if we couple SEC not only with mass, but also with online viscometer. In case of polymer samples uh, that uh, cannot be separated efficiently by SEC. There is additional alternative technique that works very well for polymers with very high molar mass, branch polymers or polymers highly functional that have tendency to interact with column packing. And uh, the most of the examples were shown for synthetic polymers 
but uh, there is no difference between polymers uh, prepared in our labs, that means synthetic polymers and natural polymers. Uh, mouse detector and uh, F4 work in the same way also for natural polymers. Uh, there are applications for polysaccharides. We can use uh, aqueous and organic solvents concerning the solvents. There is no limitation and uh, we can measure all polymers in different uh, solvents. So. Uh, let me once again uh, apologize for the technical problems at the very beginning. So I hope that you could hear me well for the rest of the webinar. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. So thank you very much, Stepan. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention so far. Now we come to um, some of your questions. So, Stepan, you can hear me? Yes, very well. OK. So there comes the first question. How can I find the refractive index increment for my samples? My samples are SBR rubber samples. SBR rubber sample. Uh, SBR rubber can be uh, the most efficient way how to characterize SBR rubber is to use uh, another concentration detector. That means uh, that is UV detector. You uh, using UV mouse and RI, you can get information about uh, the styrene fraction as a function of molar mass. Then, in case the styrene fraction does not change significantly along the molar mass axis, you get uh, the average uh, styrene fraction. Then you can calculate uh, DNDC from uh, uh, DNDC of parent homopolymers, from, from DNDC of polystyrene and polyisoprene uh, or polybutadiene. And uh, you can uh, actually use it for the calculation of molar mass. If there is a change, significant change of styrene content along the molar mass, then you have to calculate the NDC for different uh, molar masses. Uh, and uh, you would get this information. So that is uh, what you can get for SBR. OK, thank you very much. The next question. How is it able to calculate the very exact molecular mass of protein independent of its shape? No, actually, the molar mass is always measured independently of the shape. And that is an advantage of uh, light scattering. Because uh, if we look at uh, the basic light scattering equation, then you can see that there is no shape related parameters. That means that the molar mass is measured only from the intensity of scattered light at zero angle and from the concentration. That means that shape does not matter. Thank you. And there is apparently the last question for today. How precise is the measurement of the polymer conformation? Can I measure the effects of pH? or salt concentration on polyelectrolytes? Yes, in case of polyelectrolytes, uh, if you perform the measurements at uh, different uh, salt concentrations, then uh, you will probably observe the transition from random coil conformation when the repulsive forces are shielded by salt. And if you go to lower salt concentration, you uh, probably observe extension of polymer chain uh, due to electro electrostatic repulsive forces. And uh, yeah, I think you should see the difference. But of course, it depends also on, uh, on molar mass, whether the molecules are big enough to measure uh, the root mean square radius. And uh, yeah, perhaps you could also combine uh, the measurement with DLS. That is what I did not touch during this talk because of limit of time. But you can also have online DLS. That means you can measure simultaneously 
uh, MALF and uh, DLS. So this would depend on, on, on certain polymer, but certainly you should be able to see the difference uh, of pH and salt concentration. Thank you very much. Um, this was um, the last quest question that uh, you sent to us. So we are now at the end of um, our webinar. We will okay. close the webinar with a short survey that will be shown in your browser in some minutes. And it should give you the chance to hand out a short feedback to us. The next webinar will be held on January 17th and we will talk about checking protein samples for aggregates and perform effective quality control using dynamic light scattering. Thank you one more time for being our audience and we hope to talk to you in January again. Goodbye. <laughs>